Good morning, church. Pastor Bobby, pastor of Living Word in the city of Harris. Just want to say happy Resurrection Sunday um, on this beautiful day that the Lord has given us. I believe that it's important to be able to look at the circumstances that we find ourselves in and still, and still be able to celebrate today. Amen? I know that a lot of the things that people look forward to on Resurrection Sunday have been taken away, uh, going to the park, barbecuing, uh, Easter egg hunts, dressing your children up, all that's been taken away. But when those things are taken away, it challenges us to really look at what we truly celebrate and why we truly celebrate this day. Those things, while I enjoy all of those things as much as the next person, they can sometimes get in the way or take priority over the true meaning of the celebration. Today we celebrate because the Lord Jesus Christ resurrected from the grave and be what that means to you and I as born again Christians. The world celebrates this day as well, but this day is truly for the, the believer, for those who have experienced the goodness of God, who have placed their faith in the salvation that Christ brings when he gave his life at Calvary's cross and rose again on the third day. The fact that he conquered the grave means something. It means something. Our spirit bears witness to it. The Holy Spirit in us says amen. When we, when we acknowledge that Christ rose from the grave, that he's no longer in a tomb, that they can't find his bones, they can't find his ashes, there's no, there's no body because he is sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding on your and my behalf. That's significant. And today, while those, the joys that we, you know, the external joys that we may not be able to experience today, it's important that we truly celebrate what makes today important i hope that and my prayer is that you find a way to seek the face of god and, and get to a place where it's not something that you just kind of say like yeah i know i'm excited today but really genuinely are filled with the joy of the lord because christ is your savior and what jesus has done and done for you stirs your soul that's that's what we as believers celebrate today amen so with that being said um thank you for taking the time to um watch this video today uh, some of you have noticed i have a fresh haircut look at that i bring him back the throwback this is a throwback bobby look right here this is bobby circa 1994 to about 2018. i, I sported this hairdo mostly out of convenience, and now it's out of necessity. It was either this or cornrows. I was gonna do cornrows, but Sarah doesn't know how to braid, so I decided, ah, let me shave my head. So hopefully you guys can still receive from me, even though you know I'm, I got this thing going on. So uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 20. We're gonna read the story of the empty tomb, and then I'm gonna share a short message with you as to why and what, why it's significant that we celebrate the resurrection. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord God, for this day that you've given us. That we can focus on that power, Lord, that rose Christ from the dead, that dwells within us, your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord God, for that sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross at Calvary, Lord. That because of his obedience, Lord God, and his resurrection, Lord, that if we repent of our sins and place our faith in him, that we too can experience eternal life. We thank you, Lord God, for the for our salvation that is secured in his obedience. We thank you today, Lord God, that he has, get, has victory over sin, death, and the grave. Lord, we trust in the blood of Jesus, Lord God. We trust and put our faith that, that he paid our sin debt. We praise you today, Lord God. We glorify you today, Lord God. You are so worthy, Lord of all praise. You are so worthy to be exalted. You are so worthy to be lifted up. Lord, we thank you today so much, Lord God. Be enthroned in our hearts. Be enthroned in our praises. Today, Lord, I pray that we would focus our attention on you today. That today we would just celebrate with our family and our loved ones, Lord God risen from the grave lord we thank you in jesus name amen if you have your bibles again john chapter 20 i'm going to read verses 1 through 18 the word of god says now
Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciples and they and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the disciples outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen cloth lying there, yet he did not go in. Yet Simon Peter, following, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and a handkerchief that had been around his neck, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the disciples who came to the tomb first went in also, and saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went again away again to their own homes. But Mary Magdalene stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be a gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had, what she had seen and that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So here we have the story of the resurrection. And today we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the world, you know, it views this day as just an opportunity to, you know, an occasion to celebrate and party. And they, but they look, but they honestly look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ as either a lie or foolishness. But to those of us who are born again believers, to the church of, of the living God, we know that the, that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the power of God to bring salvation to mankind, to, those, to all those who believe. We, we know that. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, the scripture says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the news that Jesus was alive began to spread. It began to spread among his followers. Men at first would doubt, you know, they hear it and you could understand that they, they, don't re, they didn't have an understanding. The Spirit of God hadn't under, given them an understanding of the resurrection and to hear the re, that Christ was alive. They, there was doubt, you know, which is to be understood. But once people were faced with the reality of seeing him, to seeing the, the marks on his hand, seeing the marks on his side, Seeing the reality of his resurrection, their lives were transformed. And that same power that transformed their lives can be ours today. Amen. We don't have to necessarily physically see the resurrected body of Christ in order to believe because we now have the Holy Spirit. And so you ask yourself, do, do I know Jesus? You know, the reason, the, the only way that you could truly know that power is if you know Christ. Not that you know of him, that you've heard of him, but that you have met him. You've met the one who, who rose from the grave. And, and because of that, because he is, you've experienced that salvation, now he has changed your life. So how can Jesus change your life? Amen. Like, what does it mean? I mean, it's people think of things like, okay, yeah, you place your faith. You're looking forward to something that's going to take place in the future. And, and that is true. We, are, we, we do believe that, that we go from this life into eternal life. And because we have faith in Christ, that we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. But even more than that, there's power to change our life even today. Now, if we go back to 1 John, where we left off, we left off in verse 18. But if we read verse 19 through 20, it says, Then the, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembling for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands on his side 
And the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The first thing that we see that God is able to change in our lives is he's able to change our lives from the power of God is able to change us from fear to courage. We see that the, the disciples were here and, and he and he and they were hidden. They had locked themselves away. They were fearful because of what the Jews would do to them. They just had seen their 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 master, their their Lord crucified, and they believed that the, that they were next. And so God transforms our fear into courage. The first thing that he does is he comes to us in the midst of our fear when we're locked away, afraid, like right now. I mean, there's a lot of people putting on a brave face and they may be fronting with a lot of different things, but there's people that are fearful. Today, I'm going to tell you, I hope this message finds somebody who doesn't know the Lord. I hope that this message finds somebody who is who is faced with more, their, more, their mortality because of this pa this pandemic, seeing like that this thing is... This thing is non -dis it does not discriminate. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Mexican, Asian. It doesn't matter if you're young. It doesn't matter if you're old. It doesn't matter if you're tall, if you're short, if you're rich, if you're poor. It's it's killed actors. It's taken the life of people in the royal family. It is it does not discriminate. It doesn't matter if you're if you're physically strong. It doesn't matter if you're if you're able to fight. It doesn't matter how many guns you have. If it touches you, it can take you. And that reality can put people in a place of fear. Because they don't have a hope. See, when we're locked away in our fear, if we, if we, if we call upon the Lord, the Lord will come to us in that place of fear. In that place of confusion. He'll lift us up out of that fear. He'll lift us up out of that confusion. In our fear locked away. Jesus said in John 14, 27, he said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. See, the peace of, that Jesus gives us, it dissolves fear, bringing it, into, bringing it to an end and terminating its paralyzing power. The, 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 the peace that God gives us, it's an illuminating peace. See, when you're in a room that you don't know and it's dark, you can't see that confusion and that, and that uncertainty and it brings, it can bring fear. But see, when we allow Jesus Christ to come into our life, he illuminates, he brings understanding. He lets us know, man, that, that we have that peace that surpasses under all understanding to know that he knows our end from our beginning. And that peace, it dissolves the paralyzing power of fear. The, 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 the Holy Spirit tells us in scripture, it says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. That's what the Spirit of God gives us, that when we can experience fear, that when we invite God in, that he can take that fear away. People, too many people, when they experience fear or they begin to feel fear, they distract themselves. They get on Facebook, they get on Instagram, they get on uh, YouTube, and they don't want to face that fear, so they try to distract themselves with entertainment. But the reality is, is the, the best way to overcome that fear is to face that fear in the light of God's love for you. To know, man, that you know what? My, my, my soul is in God's hands. I'm going to do my part. Of course, I'm going to use wisdom. But I'm believing that God knows from my end, from my beginning. And God isn't going to take me until my mission on this earth is done. And so I, I have peace in that. I can sleep at night in the peace knowing that God, I'm secure in Christ. We must activate our, our, our faith by obedience to God's word and the Holy Spirit in order to remove this fear. 1 Timothy 1, 6 through 9 says, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and of a sound mind. We have to stir it up. We have to stir it up. You know, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to invite him in. This, this could be a, a divine appointment. You know what that means? It means that God in this moment is using this moment to interrupt and intercept you. He's stopping you right where you are, and he's and he and and he and these these things that are going on in the world, the fear of it opens your heart to the love of God. You have to respond. You have to say, Yes, Lord, like I want to know you, Lord God. These these Christians that that are, that are serving you, that they have a peace that surpasses that I don't understand. I, I want to know if you can provide me that peace. I believe that God, even in your homes, as you're quarantined, that God can 
brings salvation to families, to those who seek him. Jesus didn't just come to the disciples in their fear to just take away their fear, but he came to them with his peace and he encouraged them. He showed them his wounds, which did more than just confirm his identity and that he was, he was you know, that in, they saw it for who he was. The wounds were evidence of the price of salvation that he had secured so that they and I would know we indeed have peace with God. We, you know, to know that, man, I, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've made mistakes. I know that I've made mistakes unknowingly and I've made mistakes consciously. I've been, there's all types of sin, but to see his wounds, to see that, man, the price was paid for me on the cross at Calvary because he was obedient to the point of death. He paid my sin debt for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's what the Bible says. So every day in my flesh, before I knew Christ, I was earning my wages. Wages are something that you earn. You go to work, they pay you wages. They pay, they, your, your efforts in return are given finances. Your wages, they're called wages, right? The wages of sin is death. You earn death by your, by your actions, your sin. We all sin. We all sin. But the gift of God, and a gift is something you don't necessarily deserve. A gift is something that you didn't pay for. A gift is something that somebody gives you because they love you. Somebody buys you a gift, it's because they care about you. And God so loved the world that he gave us as a gift, his only begotten son. To bring us salvation, to encourage us in times of fear that God is for us and not against us. That we don't have to operate in fear, that fear doesn't have to paralyze us. God comes into our hearts and he shows us his wounds that he paid the price for us. So that we don't have to walk thinking about, oh, what's going to happen? We know we have favor with God because of the blood of Jesus. The courage we receive, it's not without purpose. Jesus knew his disciples were going to face circumstances that would change, that would challenge the peace of God. You know, God gives us gifts. He gives us certain characteristics to go out and to operate in faith. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, the word says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear. Do not be afraid of them. For your Lord, your God, he is one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Our faith like the disciples, is going to be challenged, but we must hold on to what we know Jesus has done for us. He says, be strong. That word strong, it means to prevail. Prevail. Don't allow the outward circumstances to press you. Don't allow the enemy to oppress your mind or allow depression or to allow anxiety or to allow fear to paralyze your mind or to take captive your mind where that's all you're meditating on. He says, be strong, prevail, push forward. Push forward in faith. Push forward in obedience. And he says, be of good courage. That means prove superior to. Be strong. He's saying, prevail. Push forward. He's saying, the gifts that I've given you in the Holy Spirit, I want you to push forward and prove that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Be of good courage. Prove superior to. Prove that the Spirit of God that dwells within you is able to subdue the lives of the enemy, to bring every thought into captivity, to rebuke fear, to cast out all confusion, to cast out all division. All those things that don't line up with the word and the will of God, that the Spirit of God is able to push those things out. Because you're of good courage. You're proving in your faith, in the way that you conduct yourself, that what you have in Christ is superior it's a superior spirit than the spirit of this world. You don't have to have fear when you have the Holy Spirit. Jesus wanted to, them to prevail with confidence because our God has defeated the grave and sealed us with his Holy Spirit. See, they were in that room fearful of the Jews who wanted to take their life. Jesus shows up in the midst of their fear because he's faithful. And what does he do? He says, be of good courage, be strong, and prevail. Look at me. I've overcome it. They, they put the worst on me. They did the worst they could do to me. And here I am still alive. Right? The lamb who was the lamb who was slain, but yet he lives. That's why we celebrate the resurrection. That because our faith is in him and he overcame, we now know that spirit lives within us and we can overcome. We can't allow fear to grip us and paralyze us. And paralyze, paralyze means stop you. Stop you. It just 
You were going forward and then fear comes and it intimidates you and it locks your mind up and it begins to cause you to put all your focus on it and in doing so it stops you from going forward in the purpose and the will that God has for you. God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has given us the power over fear. Fear not. Where fear is present, faith is not present. You can feel fear. Fear is just like anger or lust, those things, those feelings come, but they shouldn't hold they shouldn't hold authority to in the way that you conduct yourself. Like they shouldn't be able to speak and you you respond in obedience to them. They you need to cast them all, cast them out in obedience to God. The next thing that we see here that God brings is he brings in the resurrection is power, is power from unbelief to confidence. In verse in the same chapter of John, right, verse 24 through 28. The word of God says, now Thomas called the twin, one of the 12 was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands and, and print and the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into the side, I will not believe. After eight days, the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said to them, peace to you. And he said to Thomas, reach your hand, finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet they have believed. See, God in the resurrection of Jesus Christ has given us the power from unbelief to confidence. You and I can have confidence. Amen. Like this, like we just read, Thomas wasn't there on the evening of the resurrection. So he was disappointed and he was discouraged. And, and Thomas didn't want to be, a, he was so discouraged and so disappointed that he didn't even want to be around other believers. You know, there comes times in our lives where, the, where God is working. God is always working in the life of a believer. But sometimes we presume to know what God is going to do. We think we know how God is going to do, what he's going to do, when he's going to do it. We liken God unto ourselves and we think that we got things figured out. And God sometimes, in order to stretch our faith and test our faith and prove to us that we can't put him in a box, God will do things and it will leave us at times disappointed. It'll leave us at times uh, feeling uh, disappointed in our faith, feeling that maybe God has not fulfilled his end of the bargain, which none of that's true. And you could be so discouraged that you begin to isolate yourself from, from the other believers. You know, the, the pastor calls, you voicemail it. You don't pick up. You avoid. You avoid other believers. You avoid fellowship. You avoid your word. And you definitely ain't praying. And it's the disappointment and the discouragement that Thomas was feeling in seeing that the Lord that he had placed his faith in, who he thought was going to take a natural throne, gave, died to him. We call him doubting Thomas, but notice Jesus does not rebuke him for his doubt, but, or, but, but, but rebukes him because of his unbelief. See, doubt is a problem in the mind. We want to believe, but faith is overwhelmed by problems and questions. I remember the parable, it reminds me of the parable when he says he heals, um, he heals this person and he says to them, he tells, I think, the father. He says, do you believe? He says, I believe, help me with my unbelief. And I know a lot of people who doubt because they have experienced or seen a lot of things that cause them to question. Causes them to question the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God, because God didn't do what they expected, what that person expected him to do. And so um, doubt is a problem of the mind. It's, it's something that you have. Every believer experiences seasons of doubt. But more than but more people are like Thomas than they want to admit. They refuse to believe God and demand he prove himself to us. Well, I'm not going to do it unless he, well, God was supposed to do this, but he didn't do it. If he's God, he would do this or what. And, and the blessing is that God did not forsake Thomas and leave him in that condition, but God sought him out. He saw the genuineness of his heart. God had a, had a purpose for Thomas. And, and he saw that, that, this, that seeing him being crucified was a devastating blow to Thomas's faith. 
because he didn't understand, he lacked the understanding that as God, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways. He lacked that understanding. And so because of that, but the blessing is that God didn't forsake him. God didn't just push him away and say, well, that's up to you. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, how loving is God to come down to and lift us up where we need to be? Thomas's unbelief was exchanged with his declaration. See, doubt is a problem of the mind. Unbelief is an act of the will. I refuse to believe. I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to move forward until I see, until I can see him for who he is. I'm not going to believe because the disappointment is so powerful. That pain of being disappointed was such a, a blow to your faith that you refuse to go forward allow, uh, say, saying to yourself when you acknowledge it or not. Uh, ever, I never am going to put myself in another position where I can be disappointed like that again. And that's doubt. It stops you in your tracks. See, un doubt will, I'm sorry, that's unbelief. Doubt, it's like, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these battles in my mind you know, where I'm, where it's like, man, I don't understand what God is doing, but by faith, I know God is doing. And when I can't see, I hold on to what I know him to be. Amen. There's times as a man of God, I just am walking by. I can't see. I can't see what's in front of me. But I step forward because he tells me to step forward and because I, and, and because I trust him. I trust him not because I trust him because even though at that moment I can't see him, I trust in who I know him to be. I know God to be. I know God to be loving. I know God to be long-suffering. I know God to be merciful. I know that nothing can separate me from his love, that he knows my end from my beginning, that he will not leave me nor forsake me. And the work that he began, he's faithful and just to finish. Those things I hold on to then when God calls me to go forward and I don't understand why I go forward because I hold on to those things. Is there doubt? Doubt is present, but I shut that voice up and walk in faith. I focus my attention on the word and on the will of God. We must do that. See, doubt is something everybody's going to be, I mean, uh, doubt. But unbelief is when you refuse to walk forward even when God is speaking to you. Thomas was rebuked, not because he was doubting Thomas, because, but because he was unbelieving. Why do you not believe? You have to see. The thing that is, that is a blessing is that even when we get stubborn in unbelief, God's love for us will continue to appeal to us. Look, I understand. I understand you're hurt. I understand you're disappointed. I understand that you you thought there was a gonna that, that that I was gonna do this. I can understand how I know you wanted that with your whole heart. I know the genuineness of your heart in that prayer. But at the end of the, the day, day, I'm you know he, he says to us, I'm the Lord. And I know as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And so for some of us, it's hard to hear that. It's hard to hear like, well, how could your ways be higher? Yet this thing that it hurt me so bad happened is it can, can be a little confusing. confusing. And, and the, the truth of, of the matter, my father law used to say is that some answers we're not going to get this side of heaven. You know, I wish I could bring some some understanding that would bring you such peace or such clarity. But the reality is there's a lot of things in life that require us to go forward, even in the midst of our, our doubt. Even while our mind contemplates the challenges that we face, we still must go forward. We still must be strong. We still must prevail. Because the will of God is revealed. I want to know what God's will. I'm not going to move until you show me. Look, I'm telling you right now, if you want to get our understanding of this situation and this disappointment that you've experienced, the surest way to do that is to go forward. Because he says it, the will of God is revealed as we prevail, as we go forward. Don't stop. Don't stop. But I have doubts. Okay, walk forward in your doubts. Walk forward in the obedience to God. As you grow, you'll begin to see what God was trying to do. You'll begin to see what God was, was making known. There's a lot of disappointments that I've looked back and gone, okay, God, I understand. I mean, I don't totally understand, but some of it, it was the only way I was going to learn. The only way I was going to learn is by suffering some types of losses, experiencing certain types of adversities. Man, the only way you can know the depths of some of the things that people go through is to go through them. Now, when... When you walk forward, you can reach back into those places 
And then you can minister to people who are in that place because you've been there. God has given us the power in the resurrection to go from doubt or from unbelief to faith and confidence because he loves you. He loves me. He loves us. The power of the resurrection. If you're here and you're disappointed and I understand you may be just, you know, you, you know, there's different ways that our disappointment is manifest or made known, you know? And sometimes it's people who anger. When people tell you that God loves you, you get so full of anger. You get so full of hate. And you say to yourself, well, you, it makes you mad because it's touching a wound. Because if God loved me, then why this or why that? Can I tell you, man, go forward. I'm telling you by faith, the, the surest way out of that hate, out of that of that pain is to go forward. Cynicism, that's another way people manifest um, unbelief. Cynicism. They've been disappointed. But they don't want the world to know that they're hurt. So when you bring up the love of God, they mock it. They make fun of it. They refuse to take it seriously. seriously. They're cynical because they're covering up their pain. They don't want to have to examine it. And I'm telling you the surest way out of that cynicism, that bitter spirit, because that's what it is. It's a bitter spirit. Cynical people, for the most part, they're bitter. Their spirit, they're, 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 they've been hurt. They've been disappointed. they stuck in that place, reliving that moment. Every single day, they're not able to experience the eternal life of God. And what I mean by eternal life is not saying forever life. I'm saying the will of God in their life today. That the joy, like Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. That abundant life you're not able to enjoy because you have a cynical, bitter spirit. Because at some point you were disappointed and you've allowed that disappointment to cause you to unbelieve. And now you've locked in in that place and you're not going forward. The resurrection of Christ is the hope to bring you up out of that place. He draws near to you. He reaches his hand out to you. And it's, and it's an act of faith to be vulnerable enough to receive him in. The last thing that we see, it's in verses 29 of John chapter 20 through 30. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing that you may have life in his name. The main, the main reason why we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ and we know it to be the power of eternal life is because it's the power from death to life. That word life is one of the key words found throughout the God's, John's gospel, throughout the the book of John, the gospel of John, it's a, it's a word that we see about life, life, life. Jesus offers sinners an abundant life and eternal life. And the only way we receive both of these is through personal faith in Christ. Salvation is not resuscitation. Amen? It's not like we flatline and Jesus brings us back to life. No. Without Christ, we are not dying. We are already dead. We're dead in our sin. We're dead. dead. Christ is the resurrection because we at one point were dead, yet our faith in him, we are made alive, a brand new creation in him. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 5, the scripture says, And he and you he made alive, who were once dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also you once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, and, the, and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved you, even when you were dead in your trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. See, eternal life, that's what Christ gave us. He gave us eternal life. And this is not endless time. That's not what it means. It it's rather means a better... A better definition of eternal life is it is the, the very life of God experienced in us today. It's a quality of life more than it's a quantity of time. It's a quality of life. 
It's a spiritual experience of heaven on earth today. The Christian doesn't have to die to have eternal life, to have this eternal life. He possesses it today in Christ. We live in the eternal life of God. And that's what the cross has done. It's given us that. The victory over the grave, that we experience eternal life today. Jesus, And I said it earlier, but Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and life more in abundance. You don't have to wait. I don't have to wait. I'm going to go through things just like every single other person. I'm going to go through difficulties. I'm going to go through hardships. I'm going to go through tribulations. I'm going to go through trials. I'm going to go through uh, adversity. I'm going to suffer loss. I'm going to be disappointed. All of those things. But even in those things, I still experience them in eternal life and the glory of God to where those things that trouble actually bring growth and bring understanding and, and grow my faith in Christ. There's a scripture, it's Philippians 3, 10 through 11. Paul writes, he says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and then the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So in closing, Paul understood this. He understood the power of the resurrection to bring from fear, to, to comfort and peace, to bring from, from doubt, to faith and confidence. And Paul sums up his primary purpose in that scripture that we read right now, and that is to know Christ. Paul knew what ultimately counted was to know the Lord and his will for his life. Paul desires to know the Lord and the power of his resurrection came from no, no other motive than to enjoy the Lord in his life. That's what eternal life is, is to enjoy the presence of God in your life. All Paul wanted to do was he wanted to know more and more about Jesus. He wanted to know more and more about the power of God. He wanted to know more and more. He just wanted to draw closer and closer. He wanted to be more like Jesus. He wanted to allow every trial, every circumstance, every experience, every interaction. He wanted to see Christ in all of those things. And this is a sign of somebody who's really, who's really a mature believer and who really has connected to that source of life is that Paul was a lover of God and not a user of God. He didn't seek God because of what it gave him. He sought God because he because it was God. He loved Jesus not because hoping that he could work some type of uh, recipe that would bring him something for today, but in loving Jesus, Jesus is love. It was, it was that experience in itself that brought him to want to know more and more about God. So whether he lived or whether he died, it didn't matter to Paul. It was all part of his journey of his life to know God more and more. And today on this Resurrection Sunday, we are blessed not to be distracted by the things that normally distract us on this day, but we can in solitude go into our prayer closet because we have the time and get in and really seek the face of God and be filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit for the mere benefit of being filled with the Holy Spirit in seeking the face of God for the mere reward of finding Him. That's the reward, finding Him. Not every, all the other things, they're byproducts. My relationship with God is the, is the, it's the upward calling. It's the be, it's the greatest thing I could do is seek and find the will of God to be abiding in Him and I in Him. The byproduct of that abiding relationship, the byproduct of that is, is I, I bear much fruit, but the fruit is a result of my relationship. That's what we need to do today is celebrate, celebrate, seek and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to close and end with this, man. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through 24. I pray you would meditate on this, man, and that it would bless your life and that it would help you to, you know, be an overcomer today. The word says, thus says the Lord. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in that I delight, says the Lord. Man, delight today that you know God that you know the power of the resurrection, that you know it not as a day, that, not as a religious, but you know it because it gave you life. 
bring yourself back to that point. You need to get into your prayer closet and bring yourself to that place, man. Remember, begin to meditate on where you were when Christ came into your life, when the power of the resurrection was manifest in you intimately. And if you don't have that story, man, you need to get that story. You need to get that experience because without it, you don't have anything. Remember where God found you and you see what he did. You won't have to try to celebrate today. It'll be impossible for you to not celebrate today. When you think about the goodness and the faithfulness and the love of God. Thank you.